Action. A number of uh, intrepid bumper-to-bumper reporters insist that um, Amtrak apparently is not affected by the current computer emergency. Both trains through Minnesota and route to Chicago are operating per normal route and service. Most trains. Now, again, double-check if that's your mode of travel, but they apparently uh, appear rather unaffected. I mentioned uh, for me the miracle today. If if you want, if if you're looking for a, li- a sign of hope, for some thin read of progress, that all is not lost today. It is that our next guest, known for travel misadventures, is not stuck at the airport, Minneapolis, St. Paul. That somehow, some way, he got all the way to Cooperstown, New York, where uh, over the weekend, I think technically Sunday's the big induction day, Joe Maurer will be inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. Lavel joins us via the Connecticut Water Systems Hotline. So, what time did you leave today? Uh, I was on a 6 a.m. flight uh, to Philadelphia for a connection into Syracuse. And I got to admit, man, there were people at the airport. Who are already who are already affected by this uh, this compute damn uh, upgrade yeah. whatever they called it. Um, there was a couple I was talking to, and they got there for a five a.m. flight, and they were told their flight would not depart until five p.m. Oof. So they were headed for a day in the Minneapolis St. Paul Airport. So, so, so for whatever um, reason, you your your flight obviously was not affected. You consider, I mean, seriously, given some of the the stories you've told us. Over the years, especially most recently, um, are you shocked that you basically were ahead of the posse on this thing? I was waiting. To, I was waiting uh, once we boarded the plane for them to tell us to get off. <laughs> like <laughs> like the last time I talked to you yeah, about a yeah. uh, travel mishap, but it did not happen. It's affected the Hall of Fame ceremony here. A couple of Hall of Famers had trouble uh, getting to Cooperstown, and Wade Boggs just said, screw it, and he went home, and he's not going to come in for the weekend at all. Wow. <laughs> so so um, it is, uh, it's affecting a lot of different people in different ways. I feel fortunate not to be in that situation this time. Very much so, yeah. You should feel very... By the way, did you ever get the voucher, uh, the meal voucher that was owed you from your last uh, airline mishap? Hell to the no. Never oh, got man. it. And I tried to find a, I tried to find a way to contact the air, yeah. airline. I did. I actually sent the airline a message. They never responded. Uh, very disappointing. Yeah, very disappointing. It after at least at least we got a couple of free drinks once the plane did get in the air. But still, um, we were terribly inconvenienced that day uh, from several many many hours. So um, the you're there obviously for the obvious reason the 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 Joe Maurer induction. Um, you had yesterday. I spent a decent amount of time. In fact, did I leave the show with it? I might have. I think I might have. The piece you wrote about his MVP season, which I loved. It was a very well done piece, very well researched piece. Great anecdotes early about, in effect, uh, Joe's flu game at Wrigley Field. But I thought you left out one important component. And it surprised me because you know about this front and center. Maybe he had space limitations. I don't know what the new rules are at the Star Tribune these days. But I think one aspect of that season as odd as this sounds, worked heavily in Joe's favor, but actually ended up being a curse as well. And I think you know what that is. He hit 28 home runs that year. It, there was a feeling then like, okay, he's growing into his body. We know he's a clinically good hitter, but maybe he's going to end up being a more of a power hitter than we thought. And, of course, that was the last year at the Dome. Uh, things changed dramatically, and he never really hit with the same power again the rest of his career. So I think for some people who got disappointed, it was the tease of that season, the assumption that that was going to completely usher in a new era of Joe Maurer offense. You covered all this. You were around, I think, for all of it. W- what do you remember about that at that aspect of the story? Yeah, you know what? If, I, if, if the story would have been more 
career based, I probably would have got into that because I think it gets a little deeper than just the whole power thing. Yes. Um, it, it's the fact that he got in on the first ballot and the numbers aren't right. sparkling. They're good, but not great. Yep. Um, I, I'm, I'm at the main hotel right now and I just walked by a couple of uh, reporters who told me that uh, fellow scribes who told me that some of the veteran, uh, the veteran uh, Hall of Fame members are grumbling a little bit that Mauro got in because now the door is going to fly open for uh, Buster Posey and mm. well, Yadier Molina deserves deserves to go in. Yes, but Buster Posey and Salvador Perez and and they think it's going to be a flood of catchers. But you know, in, in hindsight, I mean, maybe I could have, but I really wanted to focus on the great things that happened that year. Yeah. it did propel him in the start. I mean, put him in that Hall of Fame, fame jet stream. Um, I think a lot of the the questions about Meyer could be another fifteen hundred words. No, that's story. true. You're right. Uh, if, you, if you if you if you look into uh, the power number situation, um, he hit eleven homers in June. He never hit more than eleven homers in any season following that. You know, <laughs> great stat. Um, yeah. Right, and you know, so I know, and plus, you know, I think the contract also plays a lot into it because as soon as he signed a one hundred eighty-four yep. million dollar contract, that's it. I think expectations. Coming off the powerful season of 2009, that contract, here we go. We're going to have a catcher that's going to be 25 and 90, you know, for the next seven years. We're going to have and another course, Johnny Bench. Not a material. Yeah, and he was a completely different kind of hitter. Yeah, that's a fair point. The contract was was part of the, uh, there's no question, the, the contract was was part of the thing, too. And well, ladies, right. ladies and gentlemen, Patrick Royce has just walked into the ballroom and is being hugged by many reporters. <laughs> As well. Well, let me, <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me try a theory on you. Because I do think it's fair to say that when his career was wrapping up, what I heard, even from ball guys, was maybe Hall of Fame, going to take a while. You know, he's kind of borderline. But I almost feel like one number, one analytic, seemed to change everything from that to first ballot Hall of Famer. And it's, you know, he's got historic war numbers, obviously. Wins above replacement numbers. I never know whether to trust those numbers, but the fact is, I'm wondering how it, it was just the emergence of that num of that analytic becoming more and more fashionable as an evaluation point, and the fact that his were historic might have gone a long way to convincing the folks who thought he was borderline that he not only shouldn't be borderline, he might be a, a first ballot. Have you ever talked to any of the other scribes and even yourself about that aspect of the story? Well, it's not not in you know maybe just casually you know for one or two minutes as part of a broader conversation, but yeah, I mean he Mauer played during a time where all the unfrozen cavemen just dis, uh, discovered uh, analytics. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, that that uh, opened our eyes to a lot of things. I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna write about it because November is the 25th anniversary of my uh, controversial Pedro Martinez omission. Ooh, nice. <laughs> and um, uh. You know, I might have voted differently if I had some of the numbers that we are using today to evaluate players. So um, I, I think that had something to do with it, too. Um, we also, you know, there was no one in the league. And Mauer did stuff that no other catcher had done. He was the first AL catcher to win batting titles. He won right. three batting titles. No catcher has done that. You know, MVP in 09. Um, one of the, I, I don't want to say one of the greatest offensive seasons by a catcher because I keep thinking about, about Johnny Bench's. Prime years and yeah, he was ridiculous. Mike Piazza's prime yeah. years and things like that, but it's up there. It may be top ten, but um, yeah, I think I think his timing may have been great. Um, especially uh, he, he 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 was an excellent catcher right off the bat, yep. and made it be known he was going to be great. And and the, the analytics and O nine really drove home that point. No question about that. Lavelle Dateline Cooperstown, New York. The uh, Joe Mauer induction. This weekend, he'll be all over that story, already has been, and will be over the course of the uh, weekend as well. If you are... By, by the way, yes. by the way, Dan, you'll, you'll probably be happy to hear this. Uh, I'm at a reception. I was getting ready to start. Mm -hmm. um, Jerry Fraley is received posthumously as receiving uh, the Career Excellence Award. Outstanding. And there's a reception about to start in his honor. And I know you know Jerry Fraley. Very well. Uh, Long-time writer for the Dallas Morning News. Great baseball scribe. Great gregarious guy. Um so uh, I just wanted to share that tidbit with you because I figured you, that would resonate with you a little bit. Yeah, it would. Uh, we we crossed paths in Atlanta. And then he followed me. I had already left the morning news in Dallas, and then he went there, but saw him on the road a lot. Uh, the, the very definition of acerbic, 
crusty, curmudgeonly sports writer. I mean, it, it, he's right there. Uh, there's no question about that. Very good reporter as well, I, I might add. It was a very sad um, end, end that he had to deal with. Uh, cancer, if I'm not mistaken. Wasn't it cancer, Lavelle? Right, yeah. right, right. Brutal. But Brutal. The, the man could be funny as hell. Yes, he could. Times. Just absolutely entertaining as hell. You know, grab your sides and laugh. Yeah. But, yeah, you're right. A serpent is a great way to describe some, uh, a lot of his demeanor. Yeah, there's no question about that. So if you are somebody who covered Joe, if you're if you're limited to here's – the the one aspect of him as a ball player that impressed me the most that you think was his greatest strength the thing that to a certain extent might have set him apart from most players or perhaps any other or most other twins certainly what's at the top of the list for you um the fact that when there's two strikes on him the the bat was just beginning uh, his his ability to remain calm with two strikes, not expand his, his strike zone very much, um, look to put the bat on the ball and, and do damage. Um, Ron Gardenhire said frequently that he thought that Maurer's two-strike approach was the best in baseball during his career there. And, you know, that, that takes a great skill because a lot of guys get two strikes on them, and they're swinging out of their asses. They're chasing, you know. They're, they're, uh, they're emergency hacking. I had never seen Maurer take an emergency hack. Uh, he may have taken a few called strikes, but um, he was able to. I know he would he would open up his stance a little bit more, lengthen his stance, and just kind of uh, not worry about trying to drive the ball, just trying to meet the ball. And a lot of times, it ended up being a line drive. That that was a remarkable thing about Joe that uh, that I remember, and his ability to slow the game down. I talked to Aaron Boone about that earlier this year. Uh, Boone played against him when he was with Cleveland, and he watched Maurer, you know, face CC Sabathia, and he couldn't believe how Maurer would square up CC's pitches and hit line drives all over the place. Uh, he had a, an ability to slow the game down, and that's something that, again, great athletes across the sports landscape have, and that's what separates, you know, people like uh, a good quarterback from a great one like Tom Brady and um, things like that. For folks who have not read the piece you wrote about his MVP season, uh, give us the basics of what you started with in that particular story regarding what might now be classified as as Joe Maurer's flu game. Well, let's start off about um, I got to rip the reporter who covered the Twins that day <laughs> for woefully underreporting the fact that Maurer was incredibly sick before the game. I think the reporter, me, wrote that Maurer was a little ill before the game. <laughs> That's what I wrote in the Star Tribune the next day. And I knew damn well that it was deeper than that. I felt bad that I did not uh, address that that day that, uh, in that coverage, in our coverage for that day. So it's been in the, the corner of my mind for uh, years and years and years. And I decided to use the opportunity to write about uh, February, uh, June 12th, uh, 2009. Joe Maher comes, flies in with the team from the West Coast, sick as a dog. Um, and he told me that he got up in the morning and was contemplating going to the hospital. That's how sick he felt. Um, I got to the ballpark. I was walking down the runway at Wrigley Field, and I turned the corner, and there's Maurer standing by the bat rack, uh, snorting, coughing, hacking, just sounding awful. And I'm like, man, you should have said that. I said, man, you sound terrible. And he was like, I know. I picked up a belt bug on the West Coast. I said, are you going to be able to play today? He says, No. He says, please say, he said, I have to, my mother's here. <laughs> and I just thought that was an incredible uh, admission uh, of the power that a mother has over her son. Uh, Teresa Maurer had scheduled a group outing to Chicago that weekend. There are about 150 uh, people in the group, including 12, 20, 20 Maurer family members. And Joe did not want to let them down. And sure enough, first to bat, home run, left center. <laughs> Uh, Twins fans are going wild. That was an incredible weekend, by the way. I know Garzy was there yes. with his buddy. Right. But the Cubs the Cubs officials told us that more Twins fans were at that series than Cardinal fans show up to play uh, for the Cubs series. You know the Cubs-Cardinals is a, Huge. is a big Midwest yeah. rivalry. They said there were more traveling Twins fans than traveling Cardinals fans when they show up to play the Cubs. That's how much uh, – there was so much Twinsness, I called it. Uh, that weekend in Chicago, and it started with a bang as Maurer. Uh, instead of going to the hospital bed, uh, sent a line drive into the seat. Um, let's, let, for the fun of it, let's play the what if game. But let, let's say, for the sake of this game, Maurer goes ahead and plays quarterback 
at Florida State University, despite warnings that, man, you're, you're a Hall of Fame baseball talent, he says, football is my first love. I want to be a National Football League quarterback. I want to go after it, so I'm going to play college football and stay with the game. How, how good do you think, I mean, when you talk to people about him and scouts, I mean, what, what, do, what do they say about what he could have been as a, as a, I mean, are we talking about a guy who had a chance to be a pro football starting quarterback? Uh, NFL starting quarterback? I don't know. I mean, how many great quarterbacks come out come out of high school and it just didn't translate uh, in the college game? Right. Uh, man, Bino Cook said that Ron Paulus is going four Heismans when he went to Notre Dame. <laughs> I don't know if he ever even had a chance to look at a picture of a Heisman during his career in Notre Dame. Uh, we will never know that. Um, but, you know, Joe threw for what, 40 touchdowns this senior year, threw for like 3,600 yards. Um and it was enough for Bobby to get Bobby Bowden's attention. And and Bobby told him the baseball didn't work out. He, his scholarship was still good at Florida State to play football. So I don't know how that would have worked out with the bonus. But um, but I, I know it would have been very interesting to see him play football, um, especially, you know, as his career went and the injury started, um, would that have been – um, would that dad have been more intensified as a football player? It would have been totally different because he's playing like once a week instead of uh, five or six days a week. I don't know, but um, I've seen him throw the football. Um, he uh, there was one the Twins got eliminated from the playoffs one year, and they came back to clean out the lockers, and they went out in the Metro Dome turf. And my quarterback for both teams was like Nick Punto, Joe Nate, and a bunch of other twins and clubbies. Uh, and Mauer was zipping the ball around the, around the field. And I was like, man, it would have been nice uh, to see what, what he could have done if he put, up, uh, put on the pad. I'll tell you another story. This starts from history. You remember 09? That was the year the Vikings had uh, the Brett Favre uh, interception game, right, against the Saints? Correct. We were going to make Joe Maurer and Brett Favre Cole. Uh, athletes of the year, uh, athletes of the year, mm-hmm. provided that we could get a picture of Maurer throwing a football with Favre, and Favre turned it down. He did. So we named, yeah. So we just gave it to oh, Maurer. That's too bad. That's, so, so sometimes it's not just it's not completely based on what you think the right choice is. It's what's the visual we can get. Right. Yeah, that's fair. right. That's honest. We're at the point now. We we probably write stories based on photos. <laughs> yeah, that's a great photo. Let's write a story Sad around. Sad but it. true. <laughs> that's that's that in some cases it might be an indictment. Oh, that would have been pretty good. I I will say this. You know, the Mauer demeanor. I think was part of what look fans what they want in the best players. They want greatness, but they also want you know that little extra edge. The guy who says bleep you. The guy who. Who, who melts down every once in a while, or the guy who seems to have that little extra voltage, which wasn't Joe, but in a quarterback, that's that's gold, man. The cool Joe Maurer. It, it, if Maurer had been a quarterback, it would have been almost like Joe Montana. It would be like, cool Joe. You know, doesn't get too high, doesn't get too low, doesn't get ruffled, doesn't care how difficult the situation is. He's got that 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 flat line going. That would have been viewed to his credit. In baseball, I think among fans, it was, you know, kind of where's the charisma? You know, where where's the edge? Right. Where's where we, we we need a little extra voltage, a la Puckett, Torrey Hunter, several others. You know, uh, so you bring that up because I worked in Kansas City for a while, um, and of course, uh, Len Dawson is a god there, yes. and this Dickens was Lenny the Cool because uh, yeah. he was a flappable, no matter how hot it got in the kitchen, you know. Um, so if he made Joe Maurer, may have been Joe Cool. In, That's in, it. in that regard, exactly. um, throwing the throwing, throwing the receivers open, um, slowing down the game, uh, knowing where to go with the ball. He's always been a good decision maker, good decision maker at the plate, behind the plate, throwing out runners, uh, great reflexes. We've seen it, you know, great athlete. Um, it could have translated to something very, very interesting if uh, he it's decided an, to pursue football. It's an intriguing thought for sure. Uh, enjoy the weekend. I'm sure you'll, be, you'll have stuff. Tomorrow, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, whatever, we'll uh, we'll pay attention to it. And uh, how hot is it going to be for the induction? Do you know? It, it says just eighty 
four right now. That's not bad. Uh, I, I tell what, I, I think it gets hotter here because it's like eighty one now, mm-hmm. and I it's, I feel like it's sweltering. Ooh. So like, yeah. we're right we're right by a lake. We're right by Lake Osico. So yeah, a lot a lot of people you recognize are here too. Dan Shaughnessy just walked right. by. Yeah. Um, and Royce's here, and Bob Elliott from Toronto, and Dave Van Dyke from Chicago. A lot of the guys that. Uh, that you rub doubles with during ball your uh, a lot of ball guys during your bring a career. Yeah, yeah. If, if not there, where? I mean, that's a ball guy's heaven for sure. All right, my friend, I appreciate the time as always. Uh, enjoy the weekend. We'll talk next week. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Lavel. That is good stuff from Lavelle E. Neal the third celebrating the Joe Mauer weekend, which will um, culminate with his induction into the Baseball Hall of Fame on Sunday. A couple of uh, transportation hell texts coming in. Flew from New York City back to Minneapolis today. Was supposed to leave uh, at at 11. Delayed until 2.15. Felt like a win. Just glad to have gotten on a plane. Currently an hour from Minneapolis. LaGuardia was pretty crazy. About 8 a.m. That's Bruce. Um, Earlier when we had Kyle Potter on, we got this text. Unnamed from a 952 guy. Day from hell. This from someone who works at the airport. And one of the... um, Talking points from Kyle Potter that we didn't get to that nobody really wants to accept, but there's some truth to it is uh, it's human nature. If your flight is lost and the airline people you talk to can't give you any indication of when, you know, how many days you're going to be delayed the whole bit, it's you're going to be mad, right? You're going to be frustrated. You're going to be cranky. But as he pointed out, who do you end up taking it out on? You end up taking it out on an individual who has absolutely no power to do anything other than be the, me- the, the the messenger. So you shoot the messenger, and it's patently unfair. Now, I would say where I would understand some anger is the is in the way the bad news is delivered. You know, uh, there are individuals uh, sometimes who work in service industries who don't have much bedside manner and and that i think is part of what causes some people then to fly off the handle not that they have any control over this particular outage but that um you know you don't have to be quite this dismissive you have to understand that people have plans and these plans have been changed dramatically they're vulnerable to that extent but uh, do your best not to take it out on people who, if they're just doing their job and professionally conveying the news that you might not want to hear, um, it ain't their deal. And I, I'm sure they could tell us some stories about what they have to put up with at times like these as well. A uh, Bottom of the hour pause now. Bottom, by the way, in an hour, our old friend Cato Kalen will join. Twins are playing the Brewers over the weekend. We'll get a scouting report on Cato's favorite baseball team. Maybe a scouting report on Cato's favorite football team as well, because training camp now is not that far off. So Cato in about an hour, top five at five in about a half hour as well. Don't go away. It's root party night on the fan. When I say on the fan, the uh, red carpet show will run when we wrap up at 630 tonight, between 630 and seven. The rest of the night is not broadcast or will not be broadcast on the flagship FM 100.3 or on the app. So you got to show up at Forgotten Star Brewing in Fridley, where all of us or most of us will be, at least for uh, some of the festivities this evening. Uh, we were reminded by a Forgotten Star Brewing guy that there are some uh, pretty interesting, some of their own food items. And I think they're going to have a couple of food trucks as well on uh, the occasion. So from here, I don't know, you know, I, I don't know Fridley well, as I mentioned earlier in the week. So from here... Well, I'm done. You're right. We're done technically in terms of live uh, programming at 6, but we'll, we are, for bumper-to-bumper purposes, replaying a portion of our interview with Gerald Posner between 6 and 6.30. So 20 minutes from here, from St. Louis Park? Is yeah, that about right, give or take, you'd yep. say? Yep. I looked, and the quickest one was 15, but, yeah, it's probably 15 to 20 In minutes. In that range. So we hope to, uh, to see at least some or many of you uh, there at one time or another, this very evening. A programming reminder for Sunday Sermons fans, Kevin Seifert is going to give us some bonus time on Sunday. He's got a really, I thought, um, useful, in-depth 
Vikings quarterback situation piece. And you say, well, what the hell's left to say at this point? Um, you'd be surprised. I thought he had a lot of good insight in the story. Um, and as we're getting closer and closer to training camp, now the news breaking today, I assume this going to be part of the top five and five. No Correct. big surprise, but J.J. McCarthy officially signed to, was it a four-year deal, I yep. believe? Um, and he, it's a long view by Seifert of not just the future for McCarthy, but sort of the the thinking that went into going after him, other options, the panics option, some interesting comments that he has put together from Kevin O'Connell. One of them, I think, in a podcast unrelated to, you know, generally speaking, his football duties. So um, it'll be a good opportunity on Sunday now that the training training camp is literally around the corner uh, to set the scene for what's going to be, let's face it, the dominant Viking story this summer, the rest of the summer into the start of the season. We know there are a number of other uh, issues that are every bit as important, maybe even more important, but, you know, the quarterback position speaks for itself. Vikings are finally in a position they've rarely been in to move up that high to get uh, invest in a quarterback, their quarterback of the future. So all of that will be uh, things we'll get to with Seifert. He is booked for 930 on uh, the Sunday Sermons broadcast. So uh, make a note, if you like to sleep in on uh, that day, you know, set your alarm for like 922. Obviously, you, you could podcast it later, but it's always better to... Uh, I would say to uh, to to play it live if at all, or listen to it live if at all possible. Um, six four six eight six is the Bradshaw and Bryant KFAN uh, text line. <laughs> Some interesting texts have come in. Um, Dan, tonight I'm going to get drunk and corner you like you two concert guy did. I regaled um, that story. I think last week or. The week before, I'd rather that six one two not do that. I think he's being tongue in cheek, but we all know what happens, unfortunately, when um, alcohol is indeed involved. And I assume that alcohol might be involved for some people as uh, as well. Uh, quick, Caitlin Clark. Oh, before we get to the Caitlin Clark item, more housekeeping work regarding the root party tonight. Uh, Garzi and I are going to do a Rue Party edition of Dr. Dan's Inbox this evening. And if you are attend, are atten- planning to attend the Rue Party event, I think that's going to take place sometime between is it, it's 7.30 and 8.30, I believe. Um, if you're going to attend, go ahead and contribute to the um, the Inbox bit because if your name gets picked and your letter gets read, you'll have a chance to win a pair of, not only win a pair of Metallica concert tickets, but also, I think, a $200 gift certificate as well. When I say gift certificate, I don't mean, like, to a certain restaurant or, or, you know, a company of some sort. It's uh, basically a $200 credit card, in effect, or debit card, whatever, that you can use wherever, I would assume, you'd want to use it, correct? Uh, Correct, and also... To get in, to the get in yes. price is the same price as the iHeartRadio app. Would that F-R-E-E be free? F R E E free. How good is that? No tickets required. No, no cover charge. Nope. Just show up whenever you want. Yes. Leave whenever you want. Well, doors open at five. Doors five. do open at five o'clock. That's true. And the uh, as I mentioned, the red carpet show is between six thirty and seven. Who's hosting that? Do we know? Uh, Halvey is hosting the, the red is? carpet bit. Okay, um, but then uh, Maxo is it's also going to be emceeing the nights. The, the, uh, the How about that red carpet. Did we have a rube party last year? No, we haven't had. When's one the since, last rube party we had since 2019? Does it go back that far? Yep, I think there was a virtual one at one point. Oh for yeah, COVID you times. might be right. Yeah, but uh, but yeah, 2019 was the last five in-person years one. since our last rube party. And by the way, I mentioned on the uh, pregame tweet, pre-show tweet. Um, very nostalgic. I still miss Rube Chat. Rube Chat used to be available at caffeine.com and it was wild. It was the is it fair to say that well, do you remember Rube Chat enough? Because you haven't been here that I've long. I've heard the tales. So uh, I yes. when I look back on Rube Chat, my recollection is that more than anything else, it was an opportunity 
for the average rube to savage any of us who were on the air. I mean, each of us had individuals who despised us and would mock, ridicule, savage, destroy, and that 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 was, I want to say, maybe 75% of what Rube Chat was about. There were, um, occasionally there was some cogent, there were cogent points being made, but most of the time it was just idiocy. It was just, it was just over the top, how how stupid and illogical and moronic can we get? And maybe I'm talking myself out of missing it <laughs> on the basis of what my recollection. Or maybe my recollection is a bit stereotyped and unfair. How many of you, let us know via the Bradshaw and Brian K. Fan text line 64686, to this day miss Rube Chat? And is there any chance, have you heard any rumblings at the return of Rube Chat or... Given the kind of vitriol we now see regularly online, is it less likely than ever that there might be such a thing as Rube Chat two Rube Chat two point oh? Uh I I wouldn't hold your breath. I'll put it that way. A lot of the vitriol that you're talking about, you know, we get that from time to time on the on the text line already. No, that's, that's true. You know, we that's don't need true. any more of that. Well, and I think also then you then you gotta have somebody, you gotta pay somebody to monitor, right? To make sure it doesn't get too obscene and too sexist (laughs) and or racist and or ageist or misogynist, whatever the case may be. So, yeah, I don't, um, my guess is that, uh, that period has, uh, come and go has gone. Somebody's trying to tell me Rube chat still exists. And then they link something via forum dot MN Rube Central. Do you know anything about that? I don't that? know if I want to click on that. I don't either. Uh, so somebody is basically trying to take that particular enterprise and move it. But that's still not the same thing because it's nothing official. Right? I mean, Rube, yeah. if, you, if it's going to be, the only place a f- official Rube chat could be is at KFAN.com. If it's not at KFAN.com, it's not an official one. It's a bootleg edition, in effect. And I don't think it carries, for that reason alone, I don't think it carries the uh, same weight. I've missed Rube Chat, uh, writes Ben, so much, even though I've never been there. Rube Chat, I think, eventually devolved into um, a place for you to ambulance chase. But again, the people who I think tended to get victimized the most were not given athletes given coaches, given Minnesota teams, it was the hosts of the shows. I mean, it, 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 man, it got, um, every pet peeve of, I want to say like the same 15 rubes who were on rube chat all the time was laid out there. It was, um, revealed, uh, it, you know, like my stuttering right now, which, by the way, Bob Newhart pointed out when we had the late, great Bob Newhart, we replayed the interview with him for five years ago yesterday. All that stuff was uh, was there. And maybe I'm trying to remember uh, ultimately why we did because there was a time where we valued Rube Chat. Well, we really we must have because and maybe it even had an advert and, you know, a promotional side to it when the station was in a very different place that you're looking for that kind of circulation and to get you know, get the blood boiling, that sort of thing. But I, I'll have to be refreshed. My memory will have to be refreshed of the reasons we ultimately de- ultimately decided that Rube Chat had run its course. But this was, you don't, you were not, were you ever on it? No, no. I I don't even know when they got yeah. rid of it. Yeah. But well, yeah, I've heard the, the legends and the horror stories, but I've never been on it now. Uh, let's do this. Let's uh, get a pause in here. I do have a Caitlin Clark nugget I want to pass along. I think it, in this case, it's a bit of misinformation regarding uh, all, uh, WNBA All-Star Weekend or game, to, which I think is tomorrow. Uh, and then we'll prepare for Top 5 at 5. Cato Kalen in the 5 o'clock hour as well. Uh, a couple texts have come into the Bradshaw and Brian Cafe and text line 64686. Um, I don't understand. Here's one. ESPN ripping Reese's about Clark. What's her deal? Who's Reese? Is Reese supposed to be Reeve? Is it a typo? Is it Angel? Could it be Angel? Good point. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, because they're playing together. Now, I believe I believe the WNBA All-Star, or there's an All-Star game tomorrow. 
of sorts that I think matches the Olympic team against the w- a WNBA All-Star team, so to speak. And Clark and Reese are on the team as teammates. Um, I think, double-check the time of that game. I think it's tomorrow night. I, I, I tend to think that the numbers on that were going to be are going to be very good. I've got it at 7.30. 7.30 uh, tomorrow night. Um, who are the big shots? I thought I had the story, and now... Yeah, here it is. I think I found it. No, that's the wrong Caitlin Clark controversy you story. you got to keep them in order. Well, there's too Caitlin many Clark of them. That's the exactly. problem. Uh, where did it go? Here it is. Uh, your guy, Colin Coward, apparently. And I don't know what the context of this was. Maybe you didn't need, you need context. I believe on yesterday's program uh, was apparently critical of what he describes as the WNBA's treatment of Clark. I need to know what he mean by WNBA, individual players, uh, what exactly is it? Uh, here's a couple quotes that will get to my main point today. She's breaking re- records every week, so part of the silliness of not allowing her on the Olympic team is she was a very quickly improving player, and now you look kind of silly. Arguably the best playmaker in the league, arguably the second best three-point shooter. I don't know. That seems valuable in Olympic competition, and she's not on the team. We've talked about that issue before. I don't know if I necessarily want to go down that road. But um, Coward continued with diving into the WNBA's decision to leave her out of the skills competition at the All-Star Game, despite being the main reason fans are tuning in. Yesterday, they also announced the skills competition for the WNBA All-Star Game, and she didn't make that either. She didn't make the three-point shooting contest? Now, my information was she was invited to participate in the three-point shooting contest and declined. In fact, double-check who won the uh, three-point shooting contest in the WNBA a year ago. Because I think, I believe, is is that, is it Ionescu? I believe it is. Uh, Yes, set the record. And yes, and I think she similarly is not participating, but I believe she also declined. Now, why she declined, I don't know. Why Clark would decline, if that information is true, I don't know. But look, uh, I've been accused of, of carrying Caitlin Clark's water. I raised my hand happily because some of the stuff that she's had to put up with as recently as what we talked about yesterday is just silly. It's just childish. But you can't make stuff up. So there's a very big difference between not being invited to participate in a three-point shooting contest and being invited and declining, right? My information is that she declined. If somebody knows different or somebody can confirm one way or the other, Bradshaw and Brian KFN text line once again is available at six. Four six eight six. I I I guess it's difficult for me to believe that the league um didn't invite her, right? I mean, what 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 by what logic would you not invite her to that uh, particular event? That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So let me know if you know. And in our um, I mentioned Cato will join five thirty. I was going to get into some uh, Trump acceptance speech stuff, but we're kind of, uh, we're getting tight here. So I'll, maybe I'll save that for between 5.15 and 5.30, right after the top five at five. And we can spend a little bit of time on that and the very latest regarding uh, the Joe Biden situation with ongoing predictions. There, there's, there are two threads to what's going on on the Democratic side and uh, what I like to call the, um, the sharks side of the equation. It's more and more he's coming to grips with being willing to listen to the possibility of moving on. And then there's another thread of reportage that is doubled, tripled, and quadrupled down on the notion that he is more dug in than he has ever been. So what the answer, honestly, I can pretend to know. A lot of people can pretend to know. I don't think we, I think it's more gut feeling than anything else right now. Um, but I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, it's got to be over, right? It's got to be over now. There's a couple of other prominent uh, Democratic politicians who've jumped on the bandwagon that says it's time for, for Joe to move on. I don't think there could be any certainty to that either. Uh, what did I ask you to find out, or did I? Um, if she declines? Yeah. Have you Inesco, seen anything on it? 
I, I haven't seen anything. On okay. It. Um, again, we have had winners in the past, WNBA and NBA, of, of a given skills contest who said, I just don't want to do it again, right? You know, I mean, there's that that's certainly possible. That wouldn't be surprising. You know, there's a part of me that would wonder why, if, if indeed it's true that Clark declined. Which, by the way, I'm seeing. You are seeing. Uh, Associated Press's Doug Feinberg yeah, confirms he's, he's that con- they. He's a good uh, reporter. Yes, that uh, Kalen Clark and um, the other one. Ionescu. Thank you. Um, both declined invitations. I don't know why you do. I don't Clark. either. I, especially if you're Clark. Yeah, that's interesting. Other than. The old deal of I'm tired. I've been running around. You know, I mean, one season bled into the other. I just I want a minute or two to myself. I guess it's it's possible, um, but they're still there anyways. That's true. You know, yeah, yeah, you're so right. What's I don't know. The difference? Yeah, that is strange, and I don't know. So, when is their skills competition? Is it during the Let's day tomorrow, see. or is it a weekend thing? They got stuff going Saturday and Sunday. I don't. I honestly, at this point, I'm not even sure. Uh, but I'm. I'll be curious if uh, if if. The texter guy, um, 651, who was talking about ESPN ripping Reeve about Clark, it said Reese. Do you mean Reeve and who's doing the ripping and what would the ripping be um, in conjunction with? We did some ripping of our own, I think, on uh, on Monday's program as well. But, um, yeah, it's a it's a strange decision. But my point is, if you're ripping, you... you, you <laughs> If you're trying to defend Clark, as um, Coward seems to be doing, that's a an enterprise which I have participated in and will continue to do so when necessary. But you can't make stuff up. If if now I don't know about the skills competition, whether she was invited, but when it comes to three point, you can't make a big issue of well, how stupid is the league? If you know what are you doing? You want to talk about uh, being biased against her for some strange reason or resentful of her presence? How do you not? Invite her to the three-point shooting contest. Well, if she's invited, then you can't make stuff up in the it, with the, the the express purpose of of trying to to defend and stand tall for Caitlin Clark. That doesn't make much sense to me. So maybe we're missing something on it. We'll try to continue to get more info. But what you pass along seems to confirm what I had read earlier as well. Top five and five will include what we got to talk about that contract. JJ McCarthy signs with the Vikes. We'll talk about.